So welcome to the Invasive Species Identification Volunteer Training. My name is Emily Beldinen and I am APIPS or the Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program's Education and Communications Coordinator. I'm joined today by Erin Vinny Volrath. Vol sorry, if I didn't say that correctly. We both have hyphens in our name in different locations and our names both start with an E. So I will be sharing our emails with you after this as well along with a number of other resources to give you. So please um, don't worry about mixing our names up at this time. So I just gave a little bit about our introductions, but I'll keep going because I want to hear about you all. An overview for today, um, after we get through some introductions about who we are, who you are, and our program, we're going to jump into what are invasive species and the Im impacts they have on ecosystems in the Adirondacks, specifically aquatic ecosystems. This might be uh, new information to you. It might be oh, you know, an old hat um, and you've volunteered for APIP in the past and you're here to refresh your your species identification skills. So we'll go through that a little quickly. Um, we're gonna jump into identification after that and Erin's gonna lead us through plants and animals. She's organized plants into different growth forms and growth habits if that helps you structure information in your mind as you're going through. Um, I believe the order is, you know, starting with submerged plants, floating plants, and moving on from there, different types of floating plants that you'll see on the surface. We'll briefly touch upon prevention, and we have lots of information to share with you all if you're so interested in how to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species. Then jumping into volunteering. So how can you join APIP this summer or your lake association if they're already uh, volunteering and have a set up relationship with APIP to go out, look for these, these plants and mostly plants, um, but some animals, while you're out canoeing, kayaking, swimming, fishing, or just enjoying, you know, dockside uh, passive relaxation activities this summer. Because without you all, we can't see uh, where these plants and animals are existing in Adirondack Park. I think we have a few more people who've just joined us. Welcome. Then we'll have another bigger Q&A at the bottom of the of the plan for today, but we're gonna, as I mentioned, we're going to pop in and out of questions throughout. So here are emails. Um, I will be sending out this information to you um, along with a number of different handouts, volunteer manuals, data sheets, and links to other recorded uh, workshops that we've had recently. So who are you? I'm gonna poll you a little bit here um, we've gotten the chat a little bit as we started and waited for the workshop to begin. Typically when we're teaching in the classroom, uh, we would be able to get to know folks a lot better. We would be able to see you and, uh, you know, go through a number of activities. Um, so right now what we're able to do is do some polls. So if you don't mind. Oh, sorry. The first poll. So I'm new to this. I apologize if it's, if it's not a perfect process. Um, need just a few more people. Okay. Oh, we have one person who's volunteered before. That's excellent. Oh, but you're also new. This is great. Um, so I'm going to share results. Can you all see that now? Thumbs up. Okay. Cool. So we have a lot of new people today. This is really excellent. This is really exciting. Um, I'm also new to this. I started with APIP in April and Erin has been here for six years. Is that right? Yep. That's exciting. Um, so it's really exciting to have all you new folks joining us. Um, volunteering with APIP is definitely a safe, socially distant activity. Um, and I'm pretty jealous of all the time other folks will get to go out on the lake and look for water chestnut and European frog bits. Um, that's really great. All right, so the next poll, I think I, oh, not that poll. 
again, I am new to this, as you can tell. Oh, here we go. I'm sorry. Good thing this is being recorded. All right. Second poll, what best describes you? Need one more person to vote. Okay, we got it. No one, no one's a plant nerd. Should I not have put the word nerd in there? I think of that as a compliment. Um, this is great. It's good to know how many different folks are in the room, you know, but now we know none of you are plant nerds. So we'll go deep into plants. Um, so that's exciting. Um, I always think that's exciting. All right, this is great. Stop share results. Okay, last poll. Have you taken workshops with APIP in the past? Okay, cool. Ooh. A lot of new folks, some repeat customers, um, and somebody who is needing to remember their plants. So that, that makes total sense. This is great. Um, thank you all for joining us. Um, this is very exciting indeed. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't share the results. I was just talking about the results. Okay, great. So a little bit about APIP. APIP is, oh, there's a little, I didn't mean to do that. APIP has been around since 1998. We are a program created by these four different uh, founding partner agencies, the Nature Conservancy, the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, the Adirondack Park Agency, and the New York State Department of Transportation. Transportation might pop out at some of you as an, you know, one of these is not like the other, but actually transportation corridors are one of the major ways that invasive species spread throughout um, New York State and the United States in general. Um, so it became apparent to DOT that we needed somebody to talk to and manage invasive species. So we were created in 1998 and we are one of, we're actually housed and co-managed by the Nature Conservancy and funded by the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. We're one of eight PRISM partners, or what we say the Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management. So if you happen to be calling in today from say the Finger Lakes or Long Island or the Mohawk Valley, there might be a different group that we can connect you to more directly if you need direct, if you need um, management or intervention or handouts in your area. If you are in the Adirondack Park, Blue Line, up until the Canadian border and Lake Champlain Valley, we are your go-to source for information, uh, reporting species, asking questions. Sometimes people even mail us plants. Um, when we had an office, people would show up with plants. We still have an office. We're just not there right now. Um, so we're here to help you in every way you need, but there might also be a regional partner that we can connect you to. So what do I mean when I say invasive species? It's complicated is my, my short answer. There's a lot of different, what they say, biogeographical context. So a lot of plants that might, and animals that might be native in one region of say North America, once you 
make it out of that region, you might have a different impact on the ecosystem. There's a lot of gray areas, so we might just have nuisance species like dandelions. There's nothing we're going to do about dandelions. Dandelions are, are here to stay. Um, and so does it make an impact is the question you have to ask yourself. And when I talk about impact, I mean an environmental harm. Is a plant or animal that is new to an area causing economic, social, or ecological challenges? Is it out-competing native plants, for instance, that um, are the basis and food for wildlife? Um, is it displacing a species where they used to thrive? Is it taking over what um, was making up the structure of their habitat or creating food for their rearing uh, young? So we have these different layers, um, and Aaron's also going to get into this a little bit in terms of what we manage and how we manage it and how we define what we manage. Um, we've got our non-native, aka exotic or introduced species, and I actually have California poppies on here, which you might find familiar, and you might see them in a native seed mix, for instance, but they're non-native to this side of the Rocky Mountains, for instance. Where I moved from in Oregon, they're actually not native even to Oregon. So even going over one state line, people might say, well, this is non-native to this area. It's introduced. You also have the second tier where we talk about invasive species. So as an example, I actually have this other North American native plant. So the non-native, just taking a step back, it's, you know, the biogeographical context, the geography it's from is not necessarily this place that we're talking about in theory, <clears throat> but it doesn't necessarily have a negative impact. It just exists and that's fine. When we take a step up to invasive species or noxious species or noxious weeds that you hear of, um, and today we're also gonna talk about animals. So I'll try not to just talk about plants. It's kind of hard for me. I love plants. I'm the plant nerd. Um, so, Invasive species though, so this is a big leaf lupin. There's thousands of different types of lupin. Don't get upset, somebody in the last workshop got so upset. They're like, I love lupins, I do too. Um, but the big leaf lupin, which is native in other parts of the United States, <clears throat> and it's an important riparian plant, it's an important wetland pollinator. In our geography here, for instance, in the Adirondacks, though it's native to North America, it's having a negative, um, it's not native to this part of North America, and it's having a very serious uh, environmental harm, which is it reproduces rapidly, it changes the fertility of the soil, and it can shift an entire ecosystem. It grows really quickly too, and they're actually huge plants. They can grow to be about three or feet, four feet tall in some instances, and they'll shade out and outcompete all of the native vegetation along a river or within a wetland. Um, and since they change the soil chemistry, they actually pull nitrogen from the atmosphere, like a bean um, or any type of legume, they're a legume. They're changing the landscape fundamentally for other plants that were existing there. Um, there might be too many nutrients in the soil now. So we're, it is a native plant to North America. It's a beautiful plant, love this plant. Um, you'll see them around because we are also learning more about this plant. We're learning more about ecosystem impacts, right? Ecology is a new science, it's always changing. Um, but we consider it an invasive species because it's negatively impacting the ecosystem and we don't know if it's also gonna negatively impact the uh, human communities, if it's displacing another species entirely. Then we get to nuisance species, so I mentioned um, dandelions. They're not going anywhere. They've been introduced um, from other continents for hundreds of years. Um, they might be annoying if you have a lot of them around, but they're not known to have the worst impact um, imaginable. There's also just some, you know, I have a European honeybee in here. They have a lot of positive ecosystem impacts, economic impacts, we can't survive without them as a, as a human global species, um, but they're also not native to North America. So as I said, it's a gray area. There's a lot of, <laughs> I'm, I'm really shortening this. I could go on forever. Um, so why are some non-native 
Why are some non-natives invasive? They lack predators and parasites once they come to a new geography. So if I were a plant or an animal and where I grew up, something would regularly eat me, um, my population would stay really small. If I go to a new place and that predator's not there, I can flourish. It's kind of like Superman coming to Earth. He, on his regular planet, he's not special. He's just a guy. Um, when he comes to Earth, our sun is totally new and there's no kryptonite. And so he is just a major success. Um, but he's not a native species. A lot of native, a lot of invasives, or a lot of species, non-native species that we consider invasive become invasive because they produce um, rapidly. I mentioned that with the lupin, but there's a lot of different species. So purple loosestrife is an example here, and we'll have more images of that um, a little bit later. You might be more used to it being very purple and in bloom. Well, this is it all dried up and releasing thousands and thousands and thousands of seeds. Um, invasive species can also reproduce by multiple means. A lot of plants we're going to talk about today, if they break off and float somewhere else, they can reproduce from a stem, from a root. Not typically a leaf, but I might be wrong about that. I'm, I'm not sure. Aquatic plants are their own universe of interesting things. This idea coming down here of generalists, it does really, really well in a lot of different habitats. A lot of native species need one specific thing. They need one specific little niche. They come out at one specific time of year versus another species that can come in and does really, really well at all things. They're Renaissance men, so to speak. And then monopolizing resources. So are they taking up all the space needed for light? Are they taking up all of the nutrients in the soil? Are they taking, are, do they grow throughout the entire year? Um, so space, resources, time, all of these things have to be considered when we define something as invasive. Um, we had a lot of people in the poll that described themselves as conservationists and uh, outdoor enthusiasts, so I don't have to tell you about all the benefits of having diverse habitat. But plants are the foundation of a food web. So everything that's evolved together in an ecosystem all these interactions of species depends on that primary producer. They create shelter and rearing habitat. So I also am coming from um, my previous position was working in some salmon restoration. And when we talk about salmon restoration, we can't have salmon without the plants covering them, um, flowing water, uh, making places for their tiny, tiny little babies. Um, it's really important to have this diverse habitat, to have shelter and food for every different stage of an animal's life. Producing oxygen, I definitely need oxygen. You definitely need oxygen. Storing and filtering and protecting fresh water. The Adirondack Park and Catskill Park are really the, the bubbles of, of, or the ecosystem functioning of those two places really produces so much fresh water for most of New York State's population. It's really incredible. And without that ecosystem, we, it would cost a lot of money to clean and house as much fresh water as those two forest preserves do. Cycling greenhouse gases, um, stabilizing sediment so we don't have erosion and soil and sedimentation into aquatic systems. Diversity also is an economic engine, not just for timber and fishing, but also for research for every, often for Every dollar, for instance, put into salmon restoration of the projects I was working on, you would have about $15 in economic development related to it, which is really interesting and important for rural communities. It's also really important to just have fun in clean, uh, pristine waters. And you all will do that by having a really good time volunteering for Erin. It's going to be really fun. Oh. Ah, is that milfoil, Erin? The other cartoon up above? Oh, yes. Um, I actually grew up on a super fun site, Creek. It didn't look exactly like this, but um, I really you really appreciate clean waterways when you don't have one. 
Um, but the ecological impacts of invasive species can be severe from biodiversity loss, so losing all the positive aspects and ecosystem functions that I just discussed, losing you know, really important key parts of a food web like we've just discussed. Um, biodiversity also increases resilience. So when we have um, changes in precipitation and temperature, AKA changes in climate, you don't have as many tools in your ecosystem toolbox to adapt to a change in climate. Um, you can also have decreased oxygen and changes in pH that cause uh, what you see in the bottom image here, this fish kill. And you can have um, a lot of different changes in temperature, which then also lead to fish kills and, and damages of water quality. Economic impacts. I'm trying not to spend too much time on this because I could go on and on, so I do apologize. Um, having clean, healthy habitats that are resilient and strong don't just, um, you know, they don't just protect tourism, but tourism is important. They don't just protect timber and timber is important. They don't just protect agriculture and agriculture is important. But invasive species can cost the United States an estimated, you know, almost $150 billion annually um, from damage, drainage, flood control, boat damage, uh, reduced property values and human health impacts. So if you've ever seen um, what they call like a cyanobacteria bloom, which can kill dogs and people, um, or have seen a red tide, you understand what the challenges of having a bloom of aquatic invasive species can do. So what can we do? Here's the purple loosestrife again. Before she produces thousands and thousands and thousands of tiny seeds. Um, but what we can do, and it's really key and unique to the Adirondack Park is prevention. Prevention is key to making sure nothing else travels into an area, but early detection, rapid response. We have a really unique opportunity here in the Adirondacks to go out, scout, and look for those small population plants, small population animals. Um, there's very few places in the world that have as few invasive species as Adirondack Park, let alone in the Northeast. Um, it's really miraculous. Um, and it's important for all of us if we enjoy this space, if we live in this space, if we play in this space, if we work in this space, to also steward this space. And we can do that by just keeping our eyes open. Um, I would say like eyes and ears, but you can't hear them maybe. Um, if it's like a squirrel, maybe, I don't know. But um, if we're learning about these plants, if we're learning about these issues and then teaching other people how to do it as well, we can catch this one purple loose strife. We can catch this one uh, mystery snail. We can catch this one, um, you know, we'll talk about all the different species and how we, we go through this early, early detection rapid response process, but it relies on increasing volunteer numbers. So I'm really glad you're here because this one plant can turn into this many plants. Um, I don't know if this wetland can come back logistically or um, physically or in terms of, or financially. So when we have a massive infestation, it's the maximum cost to eradicate it um, or just logistically impossible. I can't imagine how many herbis pounds of herbicide would be required to take this out. And then you create a whole new ecological disaster that we don't want to touch. And early detection rapid response on the part of APIP volunteers has made a real difference. Um, the Grass River, it's, you know, someone found European frogbit, this, I think it's super cute, this cute little floating plant up here um, in 2007, and people were able to catch it immediately. Um, it's in management, is that correct, Erin? Um, but in, and management is great. Look for it, find it, remove it. You're doing great just by managing that situation. And that might be the solution that's possible. But in the second and fourth lakes of the Fulton chain, where my family goes, um, Eurasian water milfoil, this very, very dense plant down here has actually been eradicated. So someone caught it in 2009 and with harvesting and removal and monitoring, it's no longer present. Loon Lake, the same with water chestnut that's up here. 
um, we, I believe it's between two and three years of, been, of uh, not being detected um, because volunteers are going out. And once it hits a certain point, a certain amount of years where it hasn't been detected, we can more safely say that it has, it has been eradicated. But it still needs somebody, it still requires somebody to go out and canoe and check if it's there, which seems really fun. And Lake Alice, which I think we should take our friend Alice to, um, Water Chestnut has, is in management. So it's on its way to becoming eradicated. Oh, we have two. Um, I'm not gonna touch this slide actually, because Aaron's gonna get to it later. I didn't mean to do this, I apologize. But, well, maybe I'll touch it a little bit. Um, we have a lot of different plants here, and we have a lot of different plants that require different um, approaches, so to speak, and to think about them in different ways. So we have uh, different levels that APIP creates. It's, you know, it structures its goals on, it structures our management plans on, it develops volunteer programs about. Um, tier two is a stage that we think we can get a species totally eradicated from our prism area. So water chestnut is an example of a tier two species that we can eradicate, it's possible. Tier three, we're gonna contain it. Just sort of manage it, keep an eye on it, make sure it's not getting out further. Um, and it takes a lot of active management to get to this, um, to take care of these species. European frogbit, I believe, is not a plant too often seen in the Adirondack prism region. And that means that our prevention methods are working. So we like to keep it boring. Keep it boring. Prevention. Clean your canoes. Keep it boring. That's the best. And then we have tier four is suppression. And Erin will talk a little bit more about, about these going forward. But tier four is, you know, it's just a step down below containment. Do you want to share anything about that right now, Erin? No, I think you covered that well. I tricked you so I could get a sip of water. <laughs> I should have said more. <laughs> yeah, keep going. So prevention, keep it boring, clean your boats. Um, prevention is absolutely key. It's cost effective too. If you are a lake management association, keep it boring. Prevention is the most affordable way to do it. Um, but it requires a lot of community outreach and education. Early detection and rapid response are the other keys to having successful eradication. So any questions right now? And then we'll move into species identification next. So nothing has showed up in the chat box, but feel free to type in any questions or unmute yourselves and go ahead and ask them. And I think now I'll take over the remote control, right, Emily Bell? Yeah, go for it. Oh, there you go. Okay, so with no questions, I'll get going right here in the plants. And I wanted to just back up one slide um, just to let everyone know that I'm going to throw a lot of information at you about some of the different aquatic plants um, and identification of those plants. And I just want you all to know to, to don't worry if, if it seems like a lot. We're going to provide you with a lot of um, different resources after the presentation today that will help with identification um, when you're in the field looking at it, all these different aquatic plants in front of you. It's more just, um, you know, this, the, this presentation is more just to give you an idea of what to look for when you're out there, um, what might be a red flag that you want to look closer at. So um, my first slide here is to talk about some of the different definitions that I'll be using as I talk about invasive plants. Um, I'll be talking about the veins for some of the plants here on the left. Um, this first image, I need to change that term there. Um, when I talk about having more of a midrib with some um, side veins, I'm gonna talk about more of a feather-like look. I'll talk somewhat a little bit about net-like um, veining on some of our floating leafed plants. Um, and then jumping over more to the right two columns, 
I'll be talking quite a bit about the edge of the leaf, whether it's a smooth edge or if it has tiny teeth or more exaggerated teeth. Um, and then also, how are, the or how are the leaves arranged on the stem? If they're alternate, it's gonna be where you have, if you're going up the stem, you have one leaf coming off one side and then you go up the stem a little bit more and you'll have a leaf off the other side and it kind of steps like that as it goes. Or an opposite leaf pattern would be where you would have two leaves that are opposite each other on the stem. And then lastly, whorled are where you have three or more leaves that are um, all at the same place on the stem. So it's whirled, I'll, I'll call it whirled around the stem. Sorry, I think I have just a little bit of a lag with my remote here. Hmm. I don't know, Emily, are you able to move it? I think that once I touch my mouse, you lose ability. Oh, okay. To, so I think you need to request it again. I apologize, everyone. Um, it's my fault. Um, so if you want to request again, Erin, you can go for it. Okay. So um, I'll start out with Eurasian water milfoil, which is our most widespread invasive aquatic plant in the Adirondack Park. We have it in about 60 lakes here. And so this one, um, frequent, it's a submerged plant. So it, it grows from the sediment up through the water column. And then once it reaches the surface of the water, it'll start growing across and create pretty dense mats that shade out any natives growing underneath. It grows pretty quickly up to about a centimeter a day in the middle of the summer. And this one dispersed primarily by fragmentation. So if you have any little segment of the stem, as long as it has a set of whorled leaves, that can grow into a new plant. To show you the distribution statewide, I have a map here from our statewide database, IMAP Invasive Species. And what we're looking at is anywhere that we have a hexagon with a yellow or orange dot in it has reports of Eurasian water milfoil. And the larger the dot, the more reports there are. So as you can see, Eurasian water milfoil is widespread throughout the state of New York. For us in the Adirondacks, it's mostly in the eastern um, region. So for identification of Eurasian water milfoil, um, first I'll talk about what the, an individual leaf looks like. And so on the photo there, the bottom left image is that of a leaf, one, a single leaf. And as you can see, it's very feather-like where you have a midrib and then tiny leaflets that go off the side. If you look at the leaflets and how they're arranged on that midrib, they're very um, precise. So you have these opposite leaflets that are you know, very nicely arranged. Also, if you look at the tip of the leaf, it's, it'll, look very, it'll be blunt, as if somebody took a pair of scissors and just cut off the top there. Um, when you see it growing, the, the top, the tip of the plant will look often red or pinkish, but this can vary from lake to lake, um, depending on, on different um, water chemistry and temperature. It will, in, later in the summer, have a flowering stalk that'll stick up above the water, and it'll be reddish or pink in color, and it'll kind of look like a pipe cleaner, almost, just sticking, you'll have a bunch of these sticking up. And then lastly, uh, you'll have quite a bit of distance in between each set of the whorled leaves. And so I forgot to mention, this has whorled leaves of usually about four leaves in a whorl around the stem. And so you'll have a big, a pretty big distance between each set of whorled leaves so that when you take Eurasian water milfoil out of the water, the leaves will collapse around the stem and look very, very rope-like. And you'll often see this wrapped around, you know, your propeller of your boat or um, the trailer. So next I'll talk about our second invasive milfoil, variable leaf water milfoil. And this one is in about 40 lakes in the Adirondacks. It will also create 
um, large canopies that shade out natives. I've noticed in the Adirondacks, this one doesn't typically reach the surface of the water. You'll usually see it growing just underneath, like in the photo here. It looks very dense and bushy. Um, you know, I've also, I've had it explained as, uh, um, oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just oh, no. have to let this one person into our room. Oh yeah. Okay. All right. Take control. I'm sorry. Oh no. That's okay. So I think I'll just give up control then request control. Request. And, um, with variable leaf milfoil, how uh, how I always picture it is um, if I, you have a very furry cat that you've scared and you have that long fur that sticks out, it's so like a very bushy cattail. <laughs> and so I'm just trying to go forward here. Yeah, I might have put you back into Eurasian water mill foil. Hmm. There it goes. Okay, and so this one, like the Eurasian water milfoil, will also um, primarily get spread around through fragmentation. And here's a statewide map of it. Um, as you can see, it's not as widespread throughout the state. Most of the populations that we have are in the Adirondacks and in the western part of the Adirondacks. And we think that has to do a lot with the water chemistry. They seem to prefer the more alkaline waters of the western Adirondack Park. For identification of variable leaf milfoil, um, it also has the feathery like leaves. That's a characteristic of milfoils. But with this one, you'll notice that the leaf um, is more of, has more of a tapered or triangle look to it. The leaflets that are um, attached to that midrib aren't as precise. So you, they won't line up like as nicely as the Eurasian water milfoil does. If you look at the stem of the plant, it's going to be a very thick, robust stem that'll be red or brown, usually in color. And so I have a photo to highlight that. This is a really bright red sample that we have here. And that, that color will vary from lake to lake. Lastly, with variable leaf milfoil, it has a very characteristic flowering stalk that'll stick up out of the water. And um, of that, the leaves are very, have um, serrated edges. So they have a lot of teeth along the edge of the leaf. Um, and it, it'll just look very different from the submerged leaves that you see. So um, the last one in this group of similar invasives that I wanna talk about is fanwort. This one is uh, a perennial that comes back and we tend to see it in the Adirondacks in deeper waters. So we know of it to be in four private lakes in southeastern part of the Adirondacks. And there we see it growing in about four to 18 feet of water. And we think that this introduction was probably from a discarded aquarium. Historically, it was a, this was a very popular aquarium plant. And you'll see as I show more pictures, how beautiful it is and why people would have wanted it in their aquarium. And again, this one also spreads primarily through fragmentation. Here is the statewide map. And so you can see, I, I keep meaning, I need to get, make sure that this is in IMAP invasives. Our population that we have in the Adirondacks would be in the southeastern um, corner of the park. And um, as you notice, many of the populations are in the southern part of the state. We thought for a long time that it wouldn't survive the Adirondack winters that tends to like warmer waters. So it was very surprising when it did pop up in the Adirondacks. For identification of fanwort, it has two leaves that are opposite each other on the stem. And uh, a key characteristic that you'll want to look for in fanwort is a stalk that connects the leaf to the stem. And so you can see it in the photo pretty clearly on the left. And that'll be, um, that'll help you identify this or tell this apart from a native that looks very similar. Um, you'll notice the leaves are, have this nice fan like look to it where the name comes from. And it will produce little white flowers that stick up out of the water, but in the Adirondacks, it very, very rarely flowers. 
So um, I'm going to take a break from invasives and talk about a few native lookalikes that look like either milfoil or fanward or both. So first uh, we have um, coontail, which also has, if you take a quick look at it, a bushy look that might look like, you know, milfoil. But if you look, take a more close look at the leaves, you'll notice that they have, they're, you know, in a whirl around the stem, but each leaf has maybe one or two forks. So you don't have that feather-like leaf that you do of milfoils. Another one that's often um, misidentified for a milfoil are some of our bladder, native bladder warts. And um, with the bladder warts, we have about eight or nine um, native bladder warts. And the key characteristic for bladder warts that you would look for is does it have a bladder somewhere on its stem? And I'll zoom into those bladders because they're pretty neat. Um, so those bladders are a carnivorous little piece of the plant. So what they'll do is they'll pump the water out of those bladders to create a little vacuum and then it has a trigger hair so that if any, you know, a little insect or zooplankton swims by and triggers that hair, it then all of a sudden sucks in that water and with the water, the little animal with it. Um, that, that is so cool. That's, yeah, how, that's how sponges work as well. Erin, can I interrupt for just one second and take the, or if you, I think there might be somebody who's waiting to get in oh, okay. on, on the participant list. Or Ooh. I can do, Are you able to do that? I can do I, it. I can't now access my little bar. I'm sorry to um, take away from bladder warts, everyone. Oh, no. Okay, we're good. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so next, I... Um, have milfoils. So we do have about eight native milfoils um, that could be mis-ID'd as one of those invasives. And um, with our native milfoils, you'll often um, see that they're a bit more stiff if you take them out of the water. As I mentioned, like the raised water milfoil will collapse around the stem. And the very belief milfoil leaves are pretty limp and wimpy. But um, a lot of the natives, when you pull them out, will keep pretty stiff leaves. Also, um, overall, the leaf, the number of leaflets, so these little um, side leaflets that are off the midrib for each leaf, tend to be fewer than we see with Eurasian water milfoil, which tends to be more than 12 leaflet pairs. Um, but so just to let you know that there might be some native milfoils that we could easily mix up with our invasives. And then lastly, oops, our um, water marigold, which is on the bottom right hand corner of the image here. And this one can easily be misidentified as fanwort because it also has these branching fan like leaves to them that are opposite each other on the stem. But if you take a close look at how the leaves are attached to the stem, they don't have that stalk that fanwort does. Also, the, um, the water marigold will have this lovely yellow flower that sticks up out of the water um, where, where its name comes from. So next I'll talk about some of our floating leaf invasives. So these will be ones that you'll see floating on top of the water. The first one I want to talk about is water chestnut. This one's primarily found in either slow or uh, slow flowing waters or in lakes. It will have um, rosettes or groups of leaves that sit on top of the water and so these form these very dense canopies that shade out native plants. And this one's a little bit different than the other ones that I've talked about is that it's an annual that will grow every year from seed. For water chestnut, we don't have many populations in the park. Of those that are in the park, not counting Lake Champlain, they're all under management. And so what's great about water chestnut and with that seed is that if you harvest the plant before it has, is able to produce seed, we will be able to slowly knock the population back. With water chestnut and identification, if you take a close look at the leaves that are floating on the surface of the water in a rosette, 
they're going to be triangular in shape with very exaggerated serrated or sorry, serrated or exaggerated teeth on the edge of the leaf. It also has a spiked seed that's very distinctive. Um, the, the drawings that you're seeing are the four spikes of the, the seeds uh, um, that you'll see. And these are always so strange looking. Um, we've seen them actually for sale because people, you know, think that they're so strange and potentially want to buy them. Um, they do have submerged leaves that are um, on the stem underneath the water. And these look very feathery like and are very different from the rosette leaves. And then if you pull the plant out of the water and you flip it upside down and you look under at the, how the leaves of the rosette are attached to the, the stem of the plant, you'll see these air bladders in each stem. And there's no natives that have these air bladders that help hold the plant at the surface of the water. Next, um, I'll talk about European frog bit. This one um, was actually introduced into Canada and has been moving kind of south and east from there. It um, has, it's dispersed a few different ways. Um, it has a little fruit that can be spread easily around. It has turians, which are little balls of leaves. And then lastly, it has, it can be spread by fragmentation as well. So um, the statewide distribution you can see, as I mentioned, it seems to be kind of moving south and east from, from Canada where it was introduced. In the Adirondacks, we have, I think, six or seven locations with, with the European frog bit. And this one might pop up in more remote areas just because it does seem to also be moved by waterfowl. So identification of the European frog bit is that it has these pretty small little floating leaves that are heart-shaped. Um, I'd say it wouldn't be bigger than maybe like a 50 cent piece in size. It produces these three petaled little white flowers that are floating uh, with a yellow center. And then it also grows in a pretty dense tangle of stems so that if you were to try to just pull out one plant, it's very hard to do that. Usually when you pull it out, you're going to pull out a whole bunch of nearby plants as well. So here's the example of the tangled um, mass that you would pull out if you're just trying to get one plant. Um, and so I also wanted to give you an ID, ID for yellow floating heart. This isn't in our tiered invasive plant um, list, but it's one that I just wanted you to all be aware of. With yellow floating heart, um, it's only known so far to be in Lake Champlain in a small patch that doesn't seem to be growing or spreading anywhere. For identification of this, um, it's a heart-shaped leaf um, that would be floating on the surface of the water. It's not too big, as you can see there, it's about you know, a finger length in size. And the edge of the leaf is gonna have a waviness to it. It'll produce a yellow flower that's extended on a long, thin petiole. So there's the example of the flower there. And if you looked at the underside of the leaf, it's gonna be purplish in color. So some of the natives that you'll come across that are floating on the surface of the water are first the yellow white water lily, which um, is a circular um, leaf that has an, a cut out of it that I always think kind of looks like Pac-Man. It has a beautiful, distinctive white um, flower that, that, fo that floats on the surface of the water. Another one that I see in a lot of places is the yellow pond lily or spatter dock. And this is more of an oval or kind of football shaped leaf to it with a cut on one end. Uh, if you were to look at the, the veining of these two, it would be more of that net like or kind of the palm of your hand. Um, in how the veins look. Of the yellow pond lily, it has a yellow flower that sticks up, but it's more like a tulip. With, you'll have, you'll see water shield. I think I see this in almost every lake that I'm on in the Adirondacks. And with this one, it's a small football shaped leaf with a, the stem coming out of the center of the leaf and no, no cuts in it. And it produces this 
distinctive gel that covers the bottom of the leaf and the stem, which feels really neat to swim through. And so that gel is a protective layer that keeps insects from eating it. And then lastly, we have a little floating heart that's a native. And uh, as you can see, that one looks kind of similar to my, what the yellow floating heart would look like, but it has a little white flower instead of a yellow flower. And also, if you look at the plant, um, just underneath the leaf, we'll have the, this structure here, and that's where the, the white flowers come out of, um, and yellow floating heart doesn't have that. Erin, is the incision on that leaf much wider than the invasive one as well? That's a good point. I'm, I'm not sure about that. But just looking at that photo, I'd say that's probably likely. And the flowers are really small, right? Yeah. Okay. So um, next, another invasive that we have in the Adirondacks, the curly leaf pondweed. And so this is also a submerged species, but I have it in its own category because of it being a pondweed. This one um, has, is a little bit different in that it, it grows early, early, early in the spring. So it often starts growing underneath the ice. And in many places, it will die back um, by mid-July. And so we know of it in 20 lakes in the Adirondacks, but it could be in more. It's just, it's growing at high abundance when people aren't necessarily out on the water yet. This one uh, spreads primarily by overwintering buds or turians, which is that photo on the bottom there. It almost looks like a little pine cone. And so you'll see this mid these midsummer floating on the surface of the water and they'll kind of float around the lake until they settle to the bottom. This one, as I mentioned, um, in the Adirondacks, we have it in about 20 lakes, but um, throughout the state, it's pretty widespread. For identification of pondweed, um, we have, it, it grows in deeper waters typically. It can grow up to about 12 to 16 feet in depth. And it grows by a sub sediment runner. So what you'll see, it, how you'll see it growing is that it'll kind of look like it's growing in a line where you'll have one plant come up and then a, a little bit further you'll have another plant because it's run, going, growing on these runners underneath the sediment. The leaves are very distinctive in that they will, they look almost lasagna noodle-like, which I have a photo here um, where the edge has this wave that's a very tight wave that looks like a lasagna noodle. Um, the overall shape of the leaf is kind of finger-like where you'll have two straight edges with a rounded tip to it. And then if you look very closely at the edge of the leaf, it has these tiny teeth. And they're hard to see. You might have to hold it up to the light to, to be able to see those teeth or a tiny you know, magnifying glass. We have, I think, over 20 native pondweeds. And um, what, what, what do, what's distinctive about a pondweed is that it has the alternating leaves to it. So as I mentioned, alternating leaves are where you have one leaf off one side, and then you go up the stem a little bit, and you have another leaf off the other side and back and forth like that. And there are a few natives that, that look similar to curly leaf pondweed that have kind of a little wave to the edge of their leaves. So two here are the clasping leaf pondweed and the white stem pondweed that are both natives. And um, what you'll wanna do is look at the edge of the leaf and our native pondweeds will have a smooth edge to their leaf. And again, those curly leaf pondweed will have the tiny teeth. Erin, can you just go back to the curly leaf pondweed one more time, just so you can see the, okay, so those are not opposite in there. Yep the edges there and then pop back down. Thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry, it bounced around on me for a little bit there. <laughs> okay. Um, I also wanted to just mention to the group about starry stonewort. This one we don't know of to be in the Adirondacks yet. Um, and it's I, there's debate about whether, I don't think many of our lakes have the correct water chemistry for starry stonewort, but a few do. So I just want to put it on your radars. Um, it was first introduced in the St. Lawrence Seaway and seems to be spreading from there. 
as you can see in the map here. And with this one, it's a, actually a macroalgae. So it's not a, a vascular plant, but an algae that, that's large. And we have a few natives that are also macroalgaes, which I'll show you in a minute. But um, with the starry stonewort, you'll see it kind of growing in a dense bush in more shallow waters, typically, kind of on the sediment or on the bottom. And when you pull up the plant, what you'll see or the characteristic that you really want to look for are star-shaped rhizoids. And so you can see someone holding it in the photo there at the bottom. I'll zoom in, hopefully, for a photo. So that's what the star looks like um, for the starry stonewort. And so a few natives that we have that are also macroalgaes are the cara or muskgrass, and that one has a very musky smell to it if you pull it out of the water, which is typically how I quickly identify that one. And then um, also Nutella, which is on the right hand there. And it, it has kind of an overall similar structure to starry stonewort, but it won't have those star-shaped rhizoids. Oh no. I think I lost. Feel free to, I can also do this, the slides if you want. Good, I think that'll help. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for everyone's patience. I mean, yeah, okay. So next um, as hydrilla, which is one of our watch species or tier one species that is focused on prevention. And so it's not yet in the Adirondacks, but we're very worried that it will show up here. It's been explained to me by one of the state experts as kind of the Godzilla of aquatic invasive plants because of how fast it grows, it will outgrow your raised water milk oil. It will also push out a lot of our invasive, other invasive plants like, you know, your raised water milk oil. And so it's just, it, it grows fast, it grows dense as this photo that you can see here, which is in um, Cayuga Lake. Um, so if you want to go to the next photo, it, or it's the map. So I think it's in 20 to 25 lakes in New York State now, uh, and it seems, it seems to be spreading. Um, most of these locations, there's been a lot of effort to try to eradicate it or get rid of it from the water bodies that it's in. You want to go to the next slide? And um, for this slide, it's a little bit different that I have hydrilla identification and then the native that looks very similar. And I wanna just talk about how to tell them apart because the native called Elodia is very widespread in the region. I think I see, find it in almost every lake that I'm in. So how you identify hydrilla, our invasive, is that it will typically have leaves that are in a whirl around the stem that are, um, lance-shaped and have um, usually four to six leaves in that whirl, where our native Elodia will typically have three leaves. There are some variations. Sometimes you will find Elodia with four, but it's, and sometimes Hydrilla will have less, but um, these are kind of just, you know, the, the typical ones that we'll come across. For Hydrilla, if you look at the edge of the leaf, it's going to have tiny teeth on the edge of the leaf, as well as spines on the midrib vein on, on the underside of the leaf, where typically, or not typically, where our elodea will be a smooth edge to the leaf. And then lastly, hydrilla, if you were to dig into the sediment around the hydrilla plant, it has these little tubers or kind of potato-like structures that it will grow, where the elodea does not have these. And with the hydrilla, it's one of those ones that has four different ways that it reproduces and spreads. It fragments, it produces seeds, it produces turians, or these little ball, like winter, overwintering buds that are like balls of leaves, essentially, and then also those tubers. So uh, that's it for our invasive plants that I wanted to go over. Have there been any questions from, from this section? I haven't seen any in the chat, but feel free to ask questions about any of the plants. I know we, we put a lot of plants out there and 
one of the follow-up materials I'm going to send you along with a recording of this workshop is um, a volunteer manual, which includes a field guide for you with by identifying features of the plant, images and drawings of the plant, and facts and identifiable, you know, written as well as visual. Okay, cool. So let's move on to animals. And um, so the, the protocols that we're going to talk about that you would use out on the lake to survey are mostly targeted at aquatic plants. So I wanted to spend the most time on that. But I also just wanted to flag the animals for you all so that you have an idea of what might, you know, if you've come across something like this out on the water, um, you'll know to maybe take a closer look. So first, uh, we have an invasive animal called spiny water flea, which is a zooplankton, so a tiny crustacean that floats in the middle of the lake. And um, on the bottom left photo there, you can see the size on my pinky nail. And uh, so you, it is visible to the eye, but hard to see. And with the spiny water flea, it has a few interesting life characteristics. It will create offspring in two different ways. It will do asexual reproduction. So the photo on the left, or sorry, on the right there, the pouch on its back is actually holding little clones of itself. And so they'll grow in this pouch and then, you know, burst out. And um, it, 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 like the growth, the kind of population growth of this through the year is an exponential growth where you'll have high populations in the fall because of all of these little cloning episodes throughout the lake. And then in the fall, it produces, reproduces sexually. And that's the photo on the left there on the pouch of the back of that spiny water flea are the little resting eggs. So these will um, overwinter and then in the sediment. And then in the spring, that's where your new population comes from. And so just, they have these interesting life cycles. Um, and with spiny water flea, how we typically see it first reported is by anglers because it gets caught on fishing lines that are being pulled through the water. And so all these different little spines that it has will catch on to the fishing lines. And so what you'll end up seeing are hundreds and hundreds of spiny water flea in this little jelly glob on fishing lines. And so it's first identified that, or you know, found usually that way. And it's also likely the way that it's spread from water body to water body is on fishing gear. So it's important to clean fishing gear between lakes. So you can go to the next slide. And just to touch on the impacts of spiny water flea. So these are very, um, they eat native zooplankton of similar size. And the native zooplankton are an important food source for our forage fish but they'll eat the native zooplankton, but with that long spine that they have, they're not good food themselves. And so they have these cascading impacts on the food web because they mess with it in that way. Um, also thinking about how they eat the native zooplankton, that no native zooplankton usually eats the algae. And so if they're, not, if they're taking away those native zooplankton, we see increases in algae potentially and decreases then in our water quality. And then lastly, they do impact fishing as well um, by gunking up the fishing lines and sometimes people lose their catch because of that. So you can go to the next slide. Um, oh, and I should mention, so the fish, or the spiny water flea is in about 10 lakes in the Adirondacks. It also has a cousin or a very similar um, invasive zooplankton, the fish hook water flea, which is only known to be in Lake Champlain um, in our region. And so the photo on the right here is spiny water flea on the bottom and then fish hook water flea on the top. And so as you can see it overall, they look very similar. They both have those long spines, but the fish hook water flea has a very characteristic hook at the very tip of its um, spine. And so it would have this very similar impacts spread the same way as spiny water flea. So you can go to the next one. Next, I'll talk about zebra mussels, which is one of those kind of poster children of aquatic invasive species, where if we talk about aquatic invasive species, we'll usually hear about zebra mussels. 
And this one is not in many waters of the Adirondacks. We have a large population in Lake Champlain. And then there are a few inland waters that have it. But overall, our water chemistry does not support zebra mussels um, in many of the lakes. For zebra mussels, they're, they grow to be about one inch maybe in length. And they kind of have this D shape to them overall. They have stripes, usually brown and white stripes, where they get that zebra mus or the zebra part of their name. And then they have these bissel threads that come out of the bottom of the shell, which is shown on the right there. And these threads will kind of grow into all different, you know, hard surfaces and almost feel like they're cementing themselves to any hard surface. So for example, um, if there was a cart in the, in the lake, they're gonna attach to that. They're gonna attach to rocks. They're gonna attach to other native mussels. I've seen them on crayfish. They like to attach to plants as well. So you can imagine and any plants that are getting caught up on a boat, they might have zebra mussels as well. And then often the shells will, will get um, brought up onto shore and cover beaches as well. So you can move to the next slide. For impacts of zebra mussels, they're really effective filter feeders. So they're taking in water and they're removing algae. So the base of the food web of the lake. And so they're taking all this algae in, it, there's, that's no longer available to a lot of our native species. And as they remove the algae, they're actually making the water more clear, which has some interesting impacts where we see more aquatic plant growth um, in lakes that have zebra mussels, they grow deeper. We see the thermocline dropping in the lake. And so deeper in the lake, underneath that thermocline, you have a nice cool, um, cool water habitat for some larger cool water fisheries. And if we lose that, that, thir that, that area, it can have large impacts on the cool water fisheries in that lake. Also, they might smother native mussels because they're attaching to them and so the native mussel can't open up and filter. We see impacts on beaches and recreation with the shells that get um, pile up on shore. And then lastly, they'll fill industrial water intakes and start living in there and clog them up. And it takes a lot of money to clear those out. So you can go to the next slide. Oh, one other thing to add is just that it's, it's important to just remember that colder water also holds more oxygen. So you're not just losing those cold water fish, you could be losing all the fish. It's kind of like the opposite of what we want to happen in a lot of freshwater systems as opposed to what we would love to see happen in our in New York's estuaries with oysters. Our native oysters won't grow this quickly. So it kind of shows you that invasive growth pattern versus a native growth pattern where something just goes a lot slower. And actually I thought of something else too to just mention with the zebra mussels. So their life, um, their life cycle, their young are actually these tiny floating villagers or what they're called, you know, but they're just kind of floating in the water. And so they can be picked up in little pockets of water and potentially moved around from lake to lake that way. And then as, the, you know, as they get a little bit older, they'll sink out of the water and attach to different hard surfaces. So you can have these really, really small zebra mussels attaching to boats or to, you know, different things that have been sitting in the water and can be moved around that way as well. And so there's a few different ways that zebra mussels will, will move from lake to lake. And so we have a watch species that's related to the zebra mussels called quagga mussels, and they're not yet in the Adirondacks. They are in some of the water bodies of New York State um, nearby, so we're worried that they'll be moved into the Adirondacks. For how you tell the quagga mussels and zebra mussels apart is a little difficult. They will have overall this D-shaped shell that'll have the stripes to it. But on the left, you see those comparison of the zebra mussel on the top and the quagga mussel on the bottom. And one of the key characteristics to look for is if you take a zebra mussel and you try to set it on its side, it will be able to stand up because the bottom is more flat, where the quagga mussel will tip over because it doesn't have that flat surface to stand on. And then also on the right, if you see them compared, you have zebra mussels on the left and then a quagga mussel on the right. 
the zebra mussel, the, the kind of the hinge between the two parts of the shell is going to be more straight across, where the quagga mussel will have more of an asymmetrical curve to the, to the two shell pieces. So we do have someone in the waiting room. Oh, you got that. I got them. Welcome. And um, just, just to touch on quagga mussels, they'll have very similar impacts uh, impacts because of their filter feeding abilities as zebra mussels, and they have a similar life cycle as well, so they can be moved around in the same way that zebra mussels can. Next, I'll touch on Asian clams, which is an invasive mollusk that we have only in one location that we know of in the Adirondacks in Lake George. With the Asian clams, they have, um, they're pretty small, uh, in at least in Lake George, they don't get to be larger than a quarter usually in size. And they have these concentric rings that, that grow or, and they, they create ridges on the shell. So if you were to have a shell in your hand and you were to use your fingernail to run it along the shell, you'd actually feel these ridges pretty easily. It kind of feels like corduroy. And then the shell will be like a tan or brown in color usually. And then the inside will have some purples, some white in color. Um, where, the sh where the two pieces of the shell come together, that hinge um, is pretty distinctive where it has three grooves to it. And they are also very effective filter feeders like the zebra mussels. You'll see very similar impacts in that they take out all the good algae, leaving very little for natives. The shells will litter the bottom and the, sh the shoreline. They'll create industrial um, clogs with the shells. Um, and I think that's it for that one. Next, um, Chinese mystery snails are another invasive animal that we have in the Adirondacks. We don't, this one we know of to be in about 15 to 20 lakes in the Adirondacks, but I also think this one has been underreported. We haven't been raising awareness about it a lot, so I, I hope everybody can keep a special eye out for this one. It's a pretty large snail that's usually brown in color. As you can see, it's in someone's hand in the photo on the right. And it will, it has this trap door or perculum that, that it can kind of shut itself into its shell with, which is pretty characteristic of, of our invasive snails. Um, and there, I think there's one native snail that I know of that also has that trap door, but it doesn't reach the same sizes as Chinese mystery snails. So that allows it from um, desiccation or desiccating, correct? So it's allowed, it's able to like live in dried up puddles if it was there or on a boat, because it's keep, it's like creating its own aquatic ecosystem. Um, were these brought in, are these like a food snail, like for escargot and stuff? I think I've seen these for sale. Yep, you're right. And yeah, I think both food and then maybe in some cases aquariums as well. Mm. So if we eat them, they'll go away. I've never tried eating them. I don't know. It could be I'm a fun sure. summer project for us. <laughs> and so um, the impacts of these aren't very well known, but they can reach very high densities. So they, we, we feel like they're, there's got to be, you know, they're having impacts. They're just hard to measure. And um, what some of the impacts that we see are with the high populations that they reach. Um, and so we see snail die-offs in all snail species, but especially with the high number of Chinese mystery snails, when you get that die-off, it can be a pretty stinky mass on your shoreline. They also, they're, they, they're grazers of algae, so they'll kind of go across different surfaces and just remove the algae. And so they're taking that food source away from natives that, that would typically eat those. They also, um... The way a snail mouth operates, it's called a rasp, and it, it's named after the woodworking tool because it is like a little, almost like a belt sander. And so snails can be voracious, voracious eaters of plant life. So that's often a pattern you see with invasive snails is just moving up a leaf and taking all of the, the plant matter with it. Um, 
So watch out for that little belt sander inside of each one. Huh, that's interesting. Um, and then the last animal that I'm going to talk about today is the rusty crayfish. And for the Adirondacks, we haven't had a recent report of rusty crayfish in the Adirondacks. We've heard of it in on the eastern shore of Lake Champlain. And there's been historic reports in the Scroon River of rusty crayfish, but it's one that, that we'd like people to keep an eye out for. Um, it is our only invasive crayfish that we know of, and it has, it, they can be a, get pretty big, you know, maybe six, about six to eight inches in size. And one of the characteristics that you, you would look for are the red spots on their sides, almost as if somebody dipped their paint, their fingers in red paint and then picked up that crayfish. They also have black bands on the tips of their claws. And I don't have a good picture of this, but if you were to look at their teeth, they're gonna have um, razor edge teeth that are smooth, like the, that have a smooth edge where all of our native crayfish have serrated teeth. And so with the impacts of these rusty crayfish are that they're kind of like little lawnmowers as they go through the lake, they're, gonna, they're, be, they're cutting aquatic plants and they're eating them. Um, and so my photo on the right there is of a lake that had a large rusty crayfish population and they, they weren't seeing a lot of aquatic plants in the lake. The, of that top photo grouping, the top left there is showing an exposure where on the bottom of that photo, you, you have where rusty crayfish can access and then there's a little fence that they can't get over. And on the other side, you can see where all the aquatic plants are growing. And so this pro research project went and removed a whole lot of rusty crayfish from this lake. And after all, a, a, a significant number were removed, they saw the native aquatic plants start coming back. And also rusty crayfish are omnivores. So they're eating aquatic plants, they're eating fish eggs, they're eating insects. So they're not very picky and they just have impacts on a large number of different native species. And this one- um, Oh, I was gonna you... say one TNC employee um, recently found a very big infestation down closer to the Albany area in Saratoga County and collected a whole bunch of them and had a little boil. Um, and so had rusty crayfish boil for dinner. So we could do that along with the escargot from this mystery snail. Right. We'll, well be I, a very interesting group of vegetarians. And with this one, I, historically it's, it's against the law now to use rusty crayfish as bait, but historically crayfish had been moved around as bait. Um, and so on occasion, boat launch stewards still do find them in bait buckets. So that's often one way that they're moved around is by people not realizing that they shouldn't be using them as bait. So we have another opportunity for questions now that we've thrown even more information at you all. Um, so feel free to either unmute yourselves and ask any questions that you've had up to this point or Put them in the chat. And next up, we'll be also talking about um, monitoring protocols, just so you know. But here. Uh, Aaron, this is Stephen Pearson with the DC. Uh, lovely presentation. Okay. I, I enjoyed that thoroughly. I did have a question about the variable leaf milfoil. Yeah. So the part 575 listed milfoil is a hybrid between the uh, Muriophyllum heterophyllum cross with Muriophyllum laxum. Okay. Do you have any idea if the if this if the milfoil you're finding is uh, that hybrid or is it or is it the um, Muriophyllum heterophyllum that is actually being uh, having a range expansion across the region or or, or and I, otherwise. I don't know Stephen I can you help me with that <laughs> yeah it's it's a it's a just a really interesting question for me that I've been thinking about the the range of uh, the variable leaf milfoil 
is, you know, the native range is still up for debate. It, it's kind of uh, has been reported historically native to the far western part of New York, uh, Long Lake, uh, Lake Erie, and I believe the far west or yeah, the far west of Lake Ontario, uh, mm -hmm. as as well as kind of within the Lower Hudson Valley. Uh, definitely, it hasn't been reported as native to the Adirondacks, uh, where where you're finding it. And the it's very hard to distinguish between the hybrid and the uh, native species. You know, uh, and the species variable in milfoil that's not a hybrid. Uh, so it's it's just unclear um, about what's happening within the within the Adirondacks as well as what's happening elsewhere statewide. Uh, the you know, variable leaf milfoil is being reported statewide uh, as an invasive species, and and it's just a question that that no one has an answer to. So I didn't know if if you had spent any time uh, thinking about that. Uh, within the Adirondacks. Well, and, and that also highlights to, yeah, just the challenge of, of identifying milfoils. And so, so I'd say for volunteers, if, if you come across a milfoil, don't be afraid to collect a sample and reach out to me and I will help happily work with you. And, um, and you know, our, our regional or our state experts like Stephen to help um, identify Make sure that we get the right identification for, for the plant that you're found. There's also a part on our website that we can show you where you, um, when you go to the contact us button on our website, you can upload a photo. Um, we've built that into our new website design. Yeah, I would just agree with with Erin. The the milfoils are really tough. Erin's very good at them. She knows uh, quite a few of of the natives, so she'll be a great resource uh, for identifying them as well. Oh, thank you, Stephen. And if, if folks are really um, getting really hooked on milfoil, we will be having a panel discussion specifically about managing milfoil. So all a number of different methods and case studies uh, from scuba divers to you know, new types of chemical control to uh, how, what kind of permits you would need in order to take on bigger projects. And that's gonna be on August 5th and I'll be sending out information about that as well. So should we jump into prevention? I know we've mentioned it throughout. Um, Sounds good. Yeah. Um, so, so as we as we've talked about, prevention is really the most cost-effective thing that we can do. Just making sure that it doesn't get here to begin with into the Adirondacks. And so, with the work of one of our part or many of our partners, but primarily from um, the Adirondack Watershed Institute, they run the Boat Steward Program, who um, is at boat launches and uh, decontamination stations around the region helping boaters inspect their watercraft, make sure that they're not carrying any invasive species with them. And one of the questions that they ask boaters is, what was the last lake you were at before you came to this one? And from that question, we're able to see, you know, these connections between different waters, different sources of aquatic invasive species to the park. So we know that we have boaters coming from the Great Lakes and from this you know, the St. Lawrence River and from different states that could potentially be carrying aquatic invasive species with them. So they're contact tracing, Erin. Yeah, they are. They are. <laughs> yeah, I never thought about it that way. <laughs> and um, so with aquatic invasive species, the science shows that the primary way that they're being spread is, you know, being attached to boats primarily motorized boats and their trailers, but we also do see it on canoes and kayaks and other boating equipment or water recreational equipment. And for aquatic plants, for the most part, it's pretty easy to inspect your boat, remove any attached plants, and you're good to go. But with the small bodied aquatic animals like spiny water flea and zebra mussels, those might be in little pockets of water 
or a tiny, you know, really small zebra mussels attached to the hull of the boat. And so we also recommend to drain any water that's in your equipment and then allow it to dry for at least five days, preferably out in the sun. And so yeah, our mantra is clean, drain, dry. And if you're not able to dry for those five days, then go to a boat wash station if you have one nearby. Um, and in the Adirondacks, we have <clears throat> um, through the Adirondack Watershed Institute that are um, staged around the region that you could visit to have your boat sprayed down with a high pressure hot water spray that would both kill and uh, remove aquatic invasive species. And so, I, um, go ahead. I, well, I was just going to say also, you know, as, as if you're out look on a lot of different waterways looking for aquatic invasives, we want to make sure that we're not the ones spreading them from lake to lake. And so as you leave a lake, make sure that you're practicing this clean, drain, and dry. I included this, thank you, Erin. I included this um, link as well, and I can share information out because we've also gotten a lot of emails recently from, you know, folks running lake associations where they maybe previously used to have volunteers at a boat launch of a private lake or homeowners association, but are not able to do that due to social distancing this summer. And so there's also resources we can help connect you to where there's lots of free signage of downloadable PDFs that folks can download, print, laminate, and staple up on your, um, your boat launch areas for for folks to just get this basic message across. Any questions there? We went heavy on the questions. I miss interacting with people. All right. So now we're going to get into volunteering, surveys, data collection, everyone's favorite activity, and reporting. So, and, um, oh. Go ahead. So, uh, so we do have, was I doing this part or you, <laughs> sorry. I think, I think you were doing this part, Erin, if that's okay. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, so, so with, just to let you know, like a lot of, of the surveys that are done every summer are thanks to volunteers, like all of you out, you know, just searching your nearby waterways for invasive species. But we also do as well have a, a team that's out doing surveys every summer, an early detection team. Um, and so just so you know, you're not alone as you're out there on the water doing your surveys. <laughs> and um, so we've had different surveys being done um, from both APIP staff, volunteers, partners, since 2002. And we've all been able to survey about 420 plus lakes in the region looking for aquatic invasive species. And amazingly, we've found that almost 75% of those lakes are still free of aquatic invasive species. And the ones that do have an aquatic invasive species, 90% of those have only one or two. And so we, in, you know, as a landscape, we are relatively uninvaded and we have a lot of opportunity to make sure that it stays that way. And so it's very important that, that you help us as volunteers continue to search these lakes, keep an eye out for invasive species, so that if when they are introduced, we hopefully find them in those small populations that we could potentially do something about. And so as a volunteer, what we ask you to do is attend a training session like you are today. Um, and then you would let us know if you want to if you want to become involved by emailing us and we'll work with you to help identify a lake if you don't have one in mind already. Um, and then, or, you know, get you set up with with whatever lake you would like to adopt. And then we'd have you do your survey anywhere anywhere between mid July to mid September. And we have that window of time because that's when aquatic plants are gonna be at their highest growth. They're gonna be closer to the surface of the water if they're a submerged species. And they're gonna hopefully have flowers or seeds or something that would help with identification. And then after you've done your survey, um, you would submit your data, um, ideally using the online IMAP system, which we'll tell you a little bit more about. 
Um, or you could also do data sheets. And so, as I mentioned, the timing of the survey would be, you know, mid-July to mid-September. And you could, and we'd ask you to do your survey at least once. Um, usually most lakes are only surveyed once every summer. And you would ide ideally do your survey on a calm, sunny day. So this is a day, you know, as your volunteers, you want to be out on the lake in that weather, right? But also the, the calmness, having very few waves helps you see into the water. And then also a sunny day helps you see into the water as well. So you'll have a more effective survey if you do it on a nice day. So I'm gonna go over some of the equipment that'll help you do a survey. Um, this isn't a list that you have to, you know, these aren't all things that you have to have, but things that might make the survey, you know, easier or better. And um, so first and foremost would be a way to get out onto the water. Um, we, you know, you, it, I recommend going out, so either on a boat or um, a paddle board or a float, just some way to get out on the water, but you could also do it from shore as well. Next, it helps to have a map of the lake, just to, get, to give you an idea overall of what, you know, where on the lake you are. If you find an invasive, you could mark the bed on that map. Um, it's just handy to have. Um, and then you would have either the data sheets or you would have a, de a device that you would have the IMAP app on, which I know Emily Bell messaged everybody yesterday with details. If you don't already have IMAP app, how to get that. <laughs> and yeah, it's this great, you know, online or, you know, mobile app that you can use that's very easy to use. Um, if you don't have the IMAP app, a GPS unit or on something on your phone to help just mark points is helpful if you find an invasive plant bed. Next on the list I have paper towels and Ziploc bags because if you find a plant sample that you aren't sure about or you want to show you know show me a photo of you'll want to collect that plant sample and save it and try to make it last as long as you can. And so what you would do is you would take the paper towel and get it a little bit wet um, squeeze it out. You only want it just damp, not sopping wet. Put it in the Ziploc bag with your aquatic plant and that'll just help keep it fresh for when you get home. And then once you get home, you can pop that in the fridge and it'll last a pretty long time, a couple weeks in the fridge. And that will give you enough time to reach out to me um, to help with identification. Um, and then we also have masking tape or labels to help mark the bag with instructions which I think I'll go into a little bit later about exactly what I would want on that label. It also says in your manual that you'll get um, more information about that as well. I have on there a bag or a jar to float the plant in. Um, with, with aquatic plants, it's easier to identify if it's floating in water. You're e easier to see those different characteristics that we talked about in a plant that's floating than if you were to have it out of the water. Also on this list, I have a rake with a rope attached. And yeah, that's the photo there on the left. And we recommend using this in lakes that you can't quite see underneath the surface of the water to see the aquatic plants growing. Um, you know, in some of the lakes in the Adirondacks, we have a lot of tannins or that brown color that really affects your ability to see into the water. And so if you don't know what plants are growing underneath you in the water, you can use these, this rake to th throw it into the water, let it sink to the bottom, and then slowly pull it back in with that rope and just see what aquatic plants come up with the rake. And so we have instructions on how to make one of those in the manual that you'll be getting. Also on the list, I have polarized sunglasses. Those really help cut the glare of the sun off the surface of the water and lets you see more easily into the water. I have a plant guide on there, um, which you can definitely take parts of the manual out with you to help with plant identification. I have a net on there. Often as you boat around the lake, you'll see different fragment, plant fragments or maybe um, snail shells floating around and you can use a net to easily grab those fragments and take a closer look at them. I have a ruler or magnifying glass that will be useful for helping with identification potentially. Um, I have a view scope on that list which is what you see that that orange triangle that the guy is using off the side of the boat. 
and what it what it is is it essentially has a clear bottom to it and so you put it under the surface of the water and it gives you a magnified view of what's going on underneath and it's really neat to boat around i will warn you that if you start using one of these it's going to take you a lot longer to do your survey because it's just amazing what you can see underneath the water so you'll just want to take your time then as you as you boat around um, I have a camera on that list uh, to, if you do find a plant that you're not sure about, you can snap a photo of it. And I'll talk more about what that photo should look like, but you could do that in the field with, as you go. And then also, um, I always love photos of volunteers out and about. So if there's any, you know, if you're out there with your camera, you can take photos as you're doing your survey and we'd love to see those. And then lastly, um, a cooler is on that list because as I mentioned, if you have a plant sample in a baggie, it's gonna last longer if you're able to put it in a cooler. Um, and so if you have room for one, I'd recommend it, but it's not required. And it's for your lunch, because you'll be out there for a while. They, we want you to snack. Right. So the protocol for the survey is what we call a meander survey or a zigzag survey. What you're going to do is you're going to go along the shore, boat along the shoreline and just go back and forth as shallow as you can get to, we say, about 15 to 20 feet deep in water. You're going to estimate that depth. Um, and what you're trying to do is you're trying to cover the littoral zone of the lake, so the area that has aquatic plants growing. And you're going to zigzag back and forth just looking for any aquatic plants. If you see aquatic plants, you'd stop and take a closer look, trying to see if any of them are those invasives that we talked about. In the deeper waters, you might want to do rake tosses, since it might be harder to really see to the bottom to see if there's plants growing. I don't have a set protocol as to when exactly you would do a rake toss. You're more using the rake as a tool to just help you verify what's growing underneath you. Um, there's certain areas of the lake that you might want to pay attention that might be more likely that an invasive would be at, such as inlets and outlets, boat, marine, boat launches or marinas or beaches, so essentially areas that would have an, you know, more people coming to them, so there might be more introduction possibilities. Areas that have existing native plant beds, we already know then that it's a good place for an aquatic plant. So invasives are gonna like that, those areas too. And then also downwind shores. So if the lake you know, has a shore that usually has a lot of the wave action being pushed to, fragments of different plants that are floating around the lake would get pushed to that shore. So it's a good place to look for, for invasives. Erin, is there a limit as to, you know, how, um, how many times one should throw a rake if, if you don't want them to dam, you know, just take a sample of the plant life there or is that of a, a concern? Um, it's, I mean, it, it could be if you're doing a lot, a lot, a lot of rakes, tosses, but if, I, I guess I don't have a firm rule as to how many to do. Okay. Um, I, it's such a small area that you're sampling that I'm not too worried about it, but it's something to, I guess, think about and consider. Okay. So as you're boating around, what happens if you find an aquatic invasive species? Well, ideally, what you would do is you would have that IMAP Invasives app that you would use and you could map the location of that invasive species as you're out. And so I have here the different, um, how you would work your way through the IMAP invasives observation while you're out in the field. Um, I have step-by-step -step instructions in your manual as to how to do this. And then um, I, Emily Bell also did an IMAP invasives training um, with, with some staff from IMAP invasives um, that is posted on our website if you want more detailed information about how to go about doing that. But I do, what you would essentially do is you would open up your IMAP app, you would click on that top right hand corner that you would add an observation, and then you would work your way through the questions that it would ask you about the invasive that you found. 
And there's ways that you can customize your list to make it more easy and quick to do observations. So, so just to add a little bit about IMAP, um, if anybody here has used iNaturalist or eBird or other pretty well-known um, mapping apps about nature and species collection, iMap is a little different. All of those apps are actually run by different nonprofit organizations or research institutes. This is taking information and helping us Rather than just understanding populations and migration in and of itself, which you know, birds, birding is very important about that. Um, this is helping APIP and our different prison partners make all of our management goals, understand distribution in order to understand, you know, what actions need to be taken to prevent the spread of invasive species or to manage those invasive species. So those four bodies of water I mentioned in the very beginning of this workshop. Um, we knew to manage those species because populations popped up on IMAP. So we're checking this. Um, a couple tips about using IMAP. Well, I'm going to send you all the recording of the workshop to go into it a little deeper. And I can also connect you all to our partners at IMAP um, to help answer any questions directly. When you're using it out in the field, you actually don't need connectivity. You can upload your information after you take photos and figure out what species it is. Um, you can and upload all of that when you're back home with Wi-Fi or near a library or somewhere else where you're accessing um, Wi-Fi. You, we're gonna send you um, a list of species to pop into your, um, your species list because this is actually hosting all the invasive species across New York State. And as we've mentioned, a lot of those aren't up in the Adirondacks or our chemistry and weather prevent those species from coming. So I'm gonna send you a list to make it a little easier. So you can set yourself up for using this out in the field. Um, certainly when you're in a boat, you wanna pull your phone out, you know, short and sweet, keep it in a Ziploc bag. Um, and so if you have all that info already in your phone and programmed in for aquatic invasives that you'll come across, um, it'll be a lot faster to do. Oh, here we go. Oh yeah, so this is just kind of walking you through a little bit more about, for example, if we found Eurasian water milfoil, you'd select that from your short list, as Emily Bell mentioned, and then you would say species detected. It would auto fill the date um, and your GPS, if you have that on, it will get that data for you right there in the app. Um, you could also, if you didn't have GPS for some reason, you could find it um, in the map. And then we would have you identify the APIP Volunteer Lake Monitoring Program as the project and um, APIP as the organization so that we get the message that, that you've put this record in. You would put in how much time you'd done your, you'd been searching the area. And then you would give information about the size of the infestation and a description of the distribution of the invasive within that bed. So it's a pretty quick little way to fill out, fill out a report. The other thing I'd add um, to this is that you have this species not detected. Um, it's sometimes easier, or not easier, sorry. It's sometimes just as important to let us know when something is not present um, definitively. So that's when you put in your time search. You're like, I did my survey, I found nothing. Fantastic, keep it boring. That's what we wanna hear. And then you'll put in the time. If it, if it took like a minute, we'd be like, whoa, that was a big lake. Are you sure it only took, you didn't see it? Um, or you might put an hour, you might put two hours. Um, but the species not detected is also really important because we wanna know where things are and we wanna know where things are not. Um, Cause that's how we're setting our management goals. And um, for you to nerd out, I'll send out, I'll send out this recording. And um, so if you're not, if you're not comfortable using the app or you don't have a phone that's, or a device that support, supports the app, we also have data sheets that you could print out and take with you in the field. And so this is what the data sheet looks like. Um, and we would just have you lay, give a, in, you know, a title for the location. If you have the ability to give us the latitude and longitude, we ask for that as well as what invasive you found, the size of the bed, 
etc. Then for each bed, invasive plant bed that you would you found in the lake. And um, so, as I mentioned, you can send me a photo of the plant that you found. So I just wanted to pause um, to give a little bit of information about what kind of photo is the most helpful for you to to collect. And so, ideally, you would have it floating in some water since that really helps us see the different characteristics of the plant. As you see in the photo, it has a white background. So my example here, I have it in a clear Tupper Lake, sorry, Tupperware <laughs> container um, with a white piece of paper underneath. But you could also have like a white Tupperware container, whatever works, you know, you can figure out what works. But that light background really helps with the contrast. I have something in the picture for scale. My example here is a ruler, but you could also use a coin, keys, some, you know, something for scale. And then I would have you do a photo of the plant that you found, like it's a, a total photo or complete photo. And then also zoom in to any characteristics that might help with identification, like seeds, flowers, if, if, you know, if you think you have hydrilla and you have this little tuber, I would want to see that tuber. Um, so yeah, just different characteristical things like that. And um, in the manual it has more information again about, you know, what kind of photo we would want and the information that we would want along with that photo. And so next, um, this year we do have a short list of lakes that we don't that we don't think have been claimed for surveying and that have been a few years since they've been surveyed. Um, so we would love to try to get people out on these lakes. Some of them are really big lakes, like you see Great Sockandaga Lake on there or Lake George on there where there's plenty of people out looking on Lake George, but it's such a big lake that um, the more volunteers we can find to help do surveys, the better. And with these large lakes, it's more that you would have a certain area that we would assign for you to do your search on. So um, we will share this list of lakes with you all in the follow-up email as well. But if you don't have one in mind, you know, think about trying to adopt one from this list. If you do have one that either you live on or that you would like to survey, that is great too. Um, we all, you know, all of our lakes need someone to keep an eye on them. So we're happy to sign you up with whatever lake you feel the most passionate about. I'll let you take this one, Emily. <laughs> um, we also, so thank you, Erin. We're going to send out that list of lakes. Of course, um, if folks do live on a lake and it's been a, um, are there any lakes you say no to, Erin? if someone says I live here and I have the opportunity to go out all the time? Nope, um, the, my only thought about that is there might be one that somebody's already claimed. And mm. then what I would probably do is connect you with the person who's already claimed it and maybe see if you both wanna you know, go out together to do, not together during COVID times, but you know, coordinate your survey and maybe go out at different times in the summer. That is good to know, yeah. So. It sounds like the next step, other than I'll be sending out all this information is, you know, mull it over, digest it. Um, don't digest any snails or crayfish without me. Um, but, you know, email us back and say, hey, I really want to do this. Um, I've got the whole summer free. Um, and if you, or if you don't, or you're just really, really passionate and you want to like squeeze it in. So we also have a number of upcoming workshops. I mentioned we have this managing milfoil workshop on August 5th. Um, a lot of folks in this room might be interested. Um, you can find all the RSVP information on our website and I'll send this out as well. But actually next Thursday, if you're interested in not just lakes, but maybe perhaps also the plants on the shoreline of a lot of streams, rivers, and lakes, you'll be interested in our not weed workshop the next Thursday, so I'm not doing this in exact chronological order, I apologize. Uh, we'll be going over identification of the number of different knotweeds you'll find in the Adirondacks, and we'll really be focusing on management of knotweed. Um, it's a very challenging uh, plant. It's maybe like the hydrilla of terrestrial. It's the, these Godzilla plants. Um, so managing milfoil is August 5th, as I mentioned. 
we're actually going to have, um, APIP hasn't done traditionally a lot of youth education in the past, but we want to be able to serve all people in the Adirondacks, and we know that families need a lot of activities right now. Um, so we're going to be hosting with, in partnership with the VIC, the Visitor, um, I said information before, but that is incorrect. The Visitor Informative Center at Paul Smith College, also funded by the DEC, uh, we'll be working with them on Wednesday, August 12th for a family workshop, and then it'll have um, self-guided, safe, socially distanced activities for families to um, take out on the trails at the 25 miles of trails at the Vic um, Stewards. And then on August 25th, we're going to talk about a whole other Godzilla weird creature that could be here and we don't know, we need help understanding it. Uh, but we'll be having a Watch Out for Jumping Worms workshop on August 25th. And then as we get into the fall, you know, inform your leaf paper friends that there's a lot of different ways to spread seeds on your footwear while you're hiking or while you're biking or you're out enjoying the great outdoors, you might be uh, inadvertently spreading something. Um, so we're going to be focusing on hikers and bikers on Wednesday, September 16th, and duck hunters on September 22nd. So you're out in the water. What are you bringing with you on your fishing? Oh, fishing. No, wrong sport. On your, you know, on your outdoor gear, on your boat, in your firewood, there's a lot of different vectors involved in duck hunting. So without any further ado, we have a few. We love questions. So, um, Here's your final opportunity to ask us some questions. Oh, we have something here. We have one specific question. Um, the custom species list. Yes, we are going to provide you all with a, a custom species list that if you're using IMAP, you will enter in when you're programming the, the, the app to fit your needs and it'll make that roll bar of potential species go from, I'm not sure, at least hundreds to, and they're all in alphabetical order and you can look at them by their common name or your scientific name, the Latin name, um, it's all scientific. Um, and we'll help you narrow that list down to the species we talked about today. Good question and I'll share that with you, but you'll have to program it in yourself. Awesome. Well, without further ado, I'll say um, please stay connected to us. So I mentioned we have our new website that we're really excited about that as a great tool to educate people in the Adirondacks and to stay connected with us um, on social media on either Facebook. We have a new Instagram account. Um, we don't have TikTok yet. We probably never will. Um, I'm too old. But um, maybe we'll get a teen intern and they'll help us with TikTok videos. But stay connected with us on social media. And I'll also send out a link of how to join our listserv, which is actually something um, created by Cornell. So it's got a funky way to email and you get an email back to stay on our listserv. But we send out news quite often. So um, we'd love to keep you coming, keep on coming back and get involved with volunteering this, this summer. Cool. I stopped sharing. <laughs>